Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Reverend Bob Wish. Okay, it's 10 o'clock. So if everyone could uh, come back inside and get ready to go. Uh, of course, we do need Reverend Bob to come. Oh, there he is. There's Patty. <laughs> we have the guest speaker. Everyone could take another couple minutes. And... <laughs> So, Reverend Bob, just to give you a, something to do as you're getting settled, uh, there's a note from Ken Okimoto who says, so I had just started working at Honolulu HQ and I was asking people who should be guest teacher for Yes Cam 3. Uh, Reverend Ron Kobata happened to visit HQ, and I think I asked him if he was interested. And then I think Ron immediately suggested this guy on the mainland called uh, named Bob Oshita. This was about 1984, so I guess uh, Reverend Bob had just returned and was restarting um, at Sacramento. Uh, Joy Nishida uh, says, Reverend Bob won't remember me, but I remember speaking. I remember meeting him as our guest speaker at Senior YBA conference when I was part of San Jose Betsuin. Senior YBA while attending college. I had mm -hmm. such a wonderful time and still remember how much fun we had about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Reverend Bob. So I can also, I also have a Reverend Bob story for everybody in the audience. Um, Reverend Bob was the, uh, the minister advisor to the Southern District Junior Young Buddhist League, which was the junior YBAs of the Southern, basically South part of, Southwestern part of the US. Um, and maybe, 600 junior YBA uh, members at the time had a big conference in Arizona and you know at the closing dance there's always a dance it's a YBA function I remember Reverend Bob Reverend Ron Kobata and Russell, the, the late Reverend Russell Hamada uh, you know dancing uh, during the dance but they were bopping which was a popular style of dancing back in the day and we're all you know we're all YBA kids going yeah, we want those ministers. <laughs> um, so that was one of the stories of, uh, you know, why did I become a minister? So I want to be like Bob. I mean, he seems like a crazy kind of minister. So, uh, so anyway, welcome back to session two. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, talking about Jodo Shinshu for you. Um, and I, could, I should also mention um, Michelle Shibuya, who is the daughter of the family that runs the Komodo Bakery, uh, Mimi's boss. Basically, she remembers you from Yes Camp. So another reference to Yes Camp. She went to one, two, and three. Yes Camp one, two, and three, and said it was a huge influence on her uh, during her high school years. Uh, so she remembers you as well. Uh, and I'm not sure. If they're, they're actually they're still working, so I don't think she's watching. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, since we're on the topic of Joseph Shinshu for you, I think that seems like a pretty good introduction. So uh, over to you, Reverend Bob. Oh, thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, I'm always addressing my target audience e ever since uh, probably coming to Sacramento has been nine and uh, eight, nine and 10 year olds. <clears throat> and, and I try to reach if I if I if I if, uh, I feel if if we can reach the eight, nine and 10 year olds in in our in our hondo. We're going to reach every adult, and even the precocious five and six-year-olds. So <clears throat> you never know. Uh, so yeah, that's always been since that time has been my my thing, unconscious and conscious focus. Um, when I think of uh, Nembutsu, the Dharma for youth, uh, of course, Dharma school comes immediately to mind that. Uh, we, when Patty and I first uh, went, uh, came to Sacramento, uh, this was going to be the focus that uh, we really wanted to make sure that, as I mentioned, you know, every child there would never feel the embarrassment that I felt in college. And I, in the process, find meaning, have realize that this does relate to us and at, at every age it can have uh, uh, impact. And, uh, Part of that, uh, when we first came, was wanting to know every child. And um, there were 75 kids. And what was wonderful is unconsciously, it's not like something we planned, but um, Patty taught the uh, 
upper division, the oldest group, uh, kids in uh, in the high school. <clears throat> and there was a popular program on TV called In Search Of at that time, back in the 80s. And they called their, their class was called In Search Of. And in her working with that class, she got to know all of the older kids. And <clears throat> that was in a way uh, gave me the chance to really circulate and, and focus on all the, the youngest ones. And uh, one of the things, again, unconsciously we did was uh, try to learn every name. Uh, you want to address every child by their name uh, if you can. And uh, which meant Friday, Saturday, and we're, I'm looking at the roster trying to remember their faces and their names. Now we have cameras, you can take pictures on your phone. <clears throat> but back then, and it was all like taking the time to look at them and jotting down notes, something about them with their worst glasses or is tall or, you know, just something about them. And, and I have to say this, and I can't emphasize it enough, Everyone is bad with names. I've heard people say, well, I'm bad with names. I'm bad with names. Everyone is bad with names. And the only way we get good with names is to try and to make the effort and to learn. And, and if as a minister, if you, if you expect people to know who you are, then you know, we have to know who they are. <laughs> and it's huge. And I, I remember uh, bringing the kansho out in the garden before Dharma school uh, very early in my first, maybe first few months at the Sacramento Bet scene. And bringing the kancho and kids and families walking by into, into, the, on, into the building, covering their ears like this or as they get closer to the bell. And there was this one little girl standing there. You know, and she just waited till I finished. You know, she's standing off, but st clearly standing, waiting for me to finish ringing the con show. When I finished, I looked at her and I said, good morning. And she looked at me and without saying another word, she just said, my name is Jan. And I said, good morning, Jan. And then, I, and then she said, good morning, Reverend Bob. And then she went in and... The next week, again, I'm reading the concho and I turn around and there she is. And I said again, good morning. And then she said, my name is Jan. And I said, good morning, Jan. And she said, good morning, Reverend Bob. Third week, huh? reading the concho. She's standing there again. I turn around and I said, good morning, Jan. And she said, good morning, Reverend Bob. <laughs> and uh, we're still very close. Um, we. Yeah, it's amazing that uh, I, that just never left me. It, it was just so cute and you know, just how how serious she was at six years old. And now that's, uh, but she's, I guess, 45. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, and a young mother. And it's a wonderful to see that, uh, that yeah, that, that we're learning from our children. They're teaching us, know my name. Please know my name. Huh? And have to make that effort. I want to know every name. And it was hard. <laughs> but we have to do that. And so growing a Dharma school takes effort. And, and I think I, I like to say this to especially the ministers and temple leaders. Uh, make Dharma school a priority. It's not just something to for kids to, to keep them occupied. Make Dharma school priority one, two, and three at your temple. And in doing this, uh, Patty and I found that uh, as the Dharma school grew, then we had a growing parent pool of helpers and members. Huh? And uh, as the Dharma school grew and the, the kids were enjoying coming, then I, we had uh, even a growing level of support from their grandparents' generation. And uh, I'll have some stories to share about that later because I thought about how there were, uh, in some instances, some uh, 
some of the uh, leaders of the temple were not too happy with uh, having me there. And they thought, you know, he's just not very traditional and uh, we don't want that. Uh, but when their grandchildren started to really enjoy coming and would talk about the Dharma school or what they learned or, you know, talk about the Dharma, it's amazing that how everything just turned around uh, and suddenly we felt support from grand, from a generation, the first generation, the grandparents' generation. And we had uh, growing support from a pool of, of parents. And uh, of course, you have the kids and they were are just so invigorating. Um, when we would teach the Metta Padma class, uh, I think it grew until one year, I think the largest class was over 30 kids. And if we, if we had 20 kids, I'd have at least 20 plus parents there. I invite the parents to come. And so, you know, I'm teaching the children and the parents are learning too. Huh? And it's amazing. Pretty soon you see them taking notes and it helps because I, and I tell the parents, it's great you're here because you can quiz them. You can help them. You can talk about this. And, and uh, uh, I, I would use this one technique when I, in teaching the kids that uh, uh, if I if I came to a point that was very very uh, maybe difficult to grasp for what I thought for someone eight nine ten years old uh, that if they weren't really paying attention you know they're they're probably you know not gonna not gonna really be able to get this and and so I would. I would say, okay, this next part, you know, kids, uh, you know, this is not for you. You don't have to listen to this. And I like to talk to the parents in the back, you know. So for the parents, you know, what I'm going to try to teach them next is this. And then I would explain it. And then I tell the kids, you, you don't have to learn to know this because it's kind of hard. So, but for the parents, I want you to understand what we're doing. And I talk to the parents. And then when I finish explaining it to the parents, then you know, and I'm looking at the kids while I'm doing this, and their eyes are like they're they're glued to every word. <laughs> the other said, you're, "We're gonna get this. It's, you know, it's not just for our parents. We're gonna understand what the, what you're trying to tell them." And and then when you finish, you know, they they're all like, "Ah, oh, we heard it. We knew what we know what you're talking about." And it's it's amazing how you know you you can you you can reach them and they can they can understand so much. Uh, so much so that um, the first maybe eight, 10 years, I wasn't sure how can I uh, talk about Onembutsu to an eight, nine, and 10 year old. And when they really could grasp the essentials of Buddhism so well, I mean, so well, uh, I thought, well, okay, let, let's try it out. And I tried different things until. You know, uh, I found things that worked. I could see it in their eyes. You know, okay, they're getting it. This is this is good. And um, so, in teaching kids, it really helped me to understand more essentially. You know, what is my responsibility? What am I trying to accomplish? And it, it gave meaning to the Dharma for me and hopefully for the kids. But Dharma school is essential. Uh, I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Don't, don't uh, consider it just, you know, one of those programs for the kids only and no big deal. It's a huge deal. It's the heart of your temple. It's the future of our temples. And when we have strong Dharma schools, we know we have a future. So uh, YBA is another thing, you know, and kids hit YBA, they're uh, the uh, the topics that Dharma doesn't change, but how we share it, the examples we use will change. And um, uh, in the YBA group, you know, uh, we would talk about like uh, uh, dating, romance, love, you know, oh, it's very interesting, uh, yeah, Buddhism and love. I mean, that's a whole topic that I've done workshops on Buddhism and love, Buddhism and romantic love. And, but I won't go into that here, but uh, uh, YBA, that age group is, is a real challenge. And uh, it, it, 
And this is where I, I want to bring in Patty because uh, she is the one who really developed the YAC retreat program. I totally uh, just am amazed that we were able to do this. Uh, shall I tell them the story? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Is my boss. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. Uh, do you want to tell it during the, the slide? Oh. Um, we share screen. Okay. 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 So I'm going to share screen here. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Oopsie. So, um, in 2003, um, a group of us in Sacramento went to Tokodo training. And let me go back a little bit to explain how this even happened. Um, I grew up in a small farming community in Central Cal called Fresno. Um, I was very fortunate to live in Fowler. Fowler in a small community. I had many moms, you know, that would always be so-called spying on all of us <laughs> and telling mom, oh, you know, your daughter was doing this and this and that. So, you know, growing up in a small community, you, you know, we, we know how that is. And so we, um, I was one that went to Dharma school every Sunday, had perfect attendance, went to Nihongako, um, you know, did the piano lessons, did, did all of that. Um, and then in my mid twenties, I moved to LA and said, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go experience the world. And this is where I met Reverend Bob. And then we decided to move to Sacramento. Uh, a year prior to when uh, Reverend Yukawa was going to retire, um, I sat down with Michiko, his wife, in the library, and I sat with her and I said, you know, Michiko, I really have enjoyed our time together. I've learned so much, you know, watching you and you teaching me how to be a minister's wife, because there are no, no books, there are no nothing. We learn by our experience, by our mistakes, you know, how, how to be a, you know, a, a good oxon to, to a, a minister. And being Sansei, I really, you know, even growing up in the tradition, it was always the minister's wife and then us. So, you know, I, I never really understood any of that. Um, but watching Michiko, I really learned um, how to be a good minister's wife. Just her demeanor and the way she treated people and her, her thoughtfulness and kindness. So in return, I said, you know, I feel like, you know, is there anything that you want to do or you or you feel you have not accomplished that you want you want to do? Because we have a year still together. You know, let's let's make it happen. And without hesitation, she said, I would like to get Tokudo ordination. And I said, Tokudo? She said, Yes. My mother received Tokudo because she was a minister's wife. My mother-in-law received Tokudo because she was a minister's wife. And I feel like I should try to get Tokudo. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, well, gosh, is Tokudo hard? I don't even know anything about it, but <laughs> Reverend let's, Yukawa let's go. Was listening to this, we were in, and, and Reverend Yukawa said, you want Tokudo? I didn't know you want Tokudo. <laughs> so by, by, any, by no means, this was not planned at all we were totally like clueless. Of course they knew, but none of us really knew. We said, let's just get a group of folks together. We'll start chanting. We started chanting Shoshinge. We started having Dharma classes. We met every month and- after No, no, you met every week. We, we planned at first to meet every month. Reverend Yukal and I said, okay, we'll, we'll have a class and we'll teach you know what you need to know to go forward for Tokudo. And, and then, we invited uh, a few people, Tim and Carol Castle and Grace Hakano. And uh, 
after the very first session, and you sensei and I thought, wow, we'll do once a month. After that first session, they, we ended and they said, well, when should we meet next week? <laughs> Such enthusiasm. And so, uh, you know. So, so three years later, Reverend Yukawa hears about a BC group going to Tokudo. And we hopped along on that particular trip. And we're so fortunate because that is where I met Dr. Bonk and the Nakamoto's, um, um, Mr. Goto. I mean, there were a bunch of, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the army means even, um, Hawaii folks that joined us. And we really, um, it, was a, it was a nice experience because of being able to meet them. So we received our tokodo, we came back and then we said, now what do we do? We, we don't know what to do. Uh, we, we talked about, we need to perhaps continue our studies. Perhaps we should have like minister assistant training. And so, and then we said, you know, Reverend Jean Sekia, you know, in Hongaji said, you need to propagate the Dharma, propagate the Dharma. And that was just something that just kind of stayed with us. So we said, you know, we're going to find a project somewhere along the line that we can propagate, propagate the, uh, the Dharma. So then we were approached by the BCA Youth Committee asking if we would be interested in hosting a one-week youth retreat. One-week youth retreat. Okay, so this was in, I think, February of 2004. They had gone to uh, Tokudo in October of 2003. They came back so enthusiastic. And the uh, youth, YAC, Youth Advocacy Committee, approached me in February at the National Council meeting and said, um, Reverend Bob, can the Sacramento Betsween host a one-week youth retreat, you know, at the temple? And I said, you mean close the temple for a week and, you know, and just have a youth retreat there? And they said, yeah, is it possible? And I said, no, <laughs> no way. You can't close down. This is a very active temple. And, you know, there's no way we can cut slow, uh, just have a week with nothing except the youth retreat and uh then i went back to the room and i i told patty i said you know what they asked me they asked me if we could close the temple and have a youth retreat and she said absolutely we're gonna do it and so we went forward we decided we need to set some goals figure out how we are to going to run this one week retreat we knew some that we knew that we wanted something different for youth. We knew that youth were attending, you know, weekend conferences, and they're they're great, they're fun. You know, I, I went to WYBL. Uh, it, it was great, but maybe something a little bit different, a little more different, something maybe more innovative, out of the box, um, something experiential for the youth, something that they could actually touch or hold on to or be responsible for. We wanted something, again, that meant some, that's going to mean something to them. And the whole concept, again, of giving back to the temple. It was so important for us as we finished our ordination that we felt we needed to give back to the temple in some capacity. And so we decided, why not do a mini tokudo? That would be fun. We presented that to the youth committee and they kind of like scratched their head and said, gosh, you know, guys, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to really turn out, whether we're even going to have any interest, but we trust you. So, okay, if this is what you want to do. Let's go forward. So in preparation for this retreat, we said, okay, we need to create the, this youth retreat. Um, and we spent one year prepping for this. We were fortunate to fly out to Ekoji. Ekoji had like a weekend or a few days, maybe more than just a weekend retreat uh, in 2004. And so Carol and myself flew out there and we saw how they ran their, their youth retreat and came back in and uh, prepared for a year. Um, and we had our first youth retreat in 2005. 
our temple did not have showers. So we had to go to mm -hmm. the temple and board and ask them to build showers for us. We uh, knew we had to clear the calendar for the year. So it gave us a good year to work on um, making sure that there were no meetings and services during that week, that whole week time, because we were actually utilizing the whole temple, not just the hondo, but the classrooms, the kitchen, you know, the annex, uh, the gym, everything. It was completely used by YAC. Mm -hmm. And we had to sit down, work up a, a curriculum, and we created um, committees who would help us, you know, women who were willing to sew robes and furoshkis, um, people who would be um, on site that would cook meals for us three times a day. Um, we arranged, you know, buses to take us, you know, to the Bay Area. There were so many facets to this um, retreat. And so many people to this day that we, we are immensely grateful for to, to help us to, to, to complete this one, one um, week. And we knew we wanted to at least end this one week with some sort of graduation so that, that the participants felt like they had reached this goal of being able to perform services at, at service, perform services at their temple. In, in case a minister was out um, guest speaking or perhaps attending a conference that they were trained to be able to run a service. And we asked, uh, and we made arrangements to make sure that our bishop was there to actually um, be a part of the graduation ceremony. Um, this is kind of like a typical day. We woke up at seven. Uh, we had a number of workshops. What is Buddhism? Who is Shinran? You know, what is Nembutsu? Then the, the Onaijin etiquette part, um, Shoshinge, Sambujo, the different chantings. Um, you know, we had three services a day. Um, then we would do the Kansho. We would do things like sushi making, um, you know, just different, different things. Um, very, some very traditional, some cultural, some, um, you know, hopefully, you know, more academic. And we wanted to really give them a well-rounded week so then they would go home feeling, you know, that they, they have learned something. And then at evening, we had teen discussion and then lights out were, was at midnight, but we all knew that they stayed up to like four or five in the morning because they would come in in the morning looking terrible. I think we have to maybe clarify that the kids were told the first day, we did the first service. And then we told them uh, after this, you guys are gonna start doing the services and you're gonna do every part of the service from setting up to leading, to chairing and you know everything. And you make it yours. And, uh, and then we would critique every service, what, what, they, what they did, and uh, how they can improve, they would, you know, and it was, uh, it was something that was a huge challenge. I mean, it's... and once we taught the kids like how to do on hygiene etiquette, then that that participant would sh then share that information to the next service person who was in charge of that particular duty. And we we set up two two tobans. That's why. So it was like one group was in charge of the service, and then. Uh, uh, the, the other one was more like critiquing. Critiquing. And then the, the first group that learned, they would teach the second group. So in teaching them, again, they had to think about what did I learn? Right. And then we would critique that. And so by the second, third day, when you've done nine, ten services, you're feeling, okay, this is comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you that our main core group, uh, at the first morning service, the, the, in the very beginning, we did the service and then we, we did a, a little welcome and then we said, well, let's take a 15 minute break and we'll go into the workshop. And we all went into the library and then we went, oh my gosh, we're so tired already. Cause I think it was the stress of not knowing how we are going to handle this week. We're probably all in our um, 40s, 
50s, uh, 50s <laughs> you know, and to, to have this kind of schedule every day for a week, you know, that, yeah, it was really, mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was challenging, but it, it was good. It was all good. So um, then after the first retreat, um, it was hard. All the part, or I, I shouldn't say all, but I would say most of the participants cried at the last service at the last uh, team gathering, kind of like our, our thank you, our reflections, because they really felt that, you know, this retreat was over and, you know, are they ever going to be able to do this again? Or will they be able to ever see this again? Because at this point, we said, we'll do this one week youth retreat, but we're not sure what's going to happen after this. But we came home and we realized that we felt the same way too, that there was, there was something, there was a potential there to, to make this grow. And so we asked the committee, could we, do we have funding that we can do a reunion retreat six months later? And let's pick one of the participants home temple so they can share again, their temple and their temple <laughs> members can see what did our, what do we send our our child to? And reinforce also uh, every that you know they are a group that they work together and everything they learn applies no matter where they are. It was very interesting that um, I had a couple of uh, Ji Chan Ba Chan's moms and dads kind of pulled me aside and said, "What did you do to our child?" And I said, "What do you mean?" They said. They came back and they they chant now. They seem to be uh, much more helpful. They want to attend service. Uh, what happened during that week? And so that is still somewhat of a mystery for us that we cannot pinpoint um, exactly what happened, but some something transforms in that one week. And it seems to happen at every retreat some a little bit more differently, but there is a, 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 a some sort of transformation that happened. So then after that, the participants asked for more advanced training. So we called it advanced training. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the committee itself did not create these programs. It was at the request of the participants that we created these, these next few events. Um, they wanted to include others who did not attend the retreat. So then we created the Young Leaders Today. And it was really very much a leadership uh, workshop. Um, so YC really became more than just the retreat. I mean, we organized and planned, became more involved with the Junior Y Summit, the College Summit. Um, there were so many youth activities um, that we became involved in. Um, I think the, the website was really important in that the database where we kept 400 um, kids and, and many of them too that graduated from high school and, and were perhaps moving from let's say Seattle down to LA really had no, they didn't really know anybody but we, we had the ability to be able to say, oh, you know what, we have a couple of people here in LA who is going to UCLA, they, they attended the retreat. So why don't we hook them up and then they can become friends or they, they know another person who went through the retreat. Because the retreat for the, thir for the 13 years was always the same. The schedule was always the same. The teachings were always the same. So if you were year one or if you were year nine or 13, you, you had so much the same common. experience. The right? experience you, was the same, mm -hmm. was was virtually the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though each retreat was unique and mm -hmm. had its own personality, what we taught and how we taught it, the the way, I mean, the 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 order of things being taught, and you know, on the fourth day to take a field trip to break up being in just at the bed swing, going to Berkeley and San Francisco. Uh, it was all thought out. They all did it the very same way, in the same order. Uh, it wasn't, yeah. 
that consistency really, I think, bonded all the groups together. So I see the many opportunities we were able to participate in the opening service for the BC National Council meeting. A group of YCers raised funds on their own and they traveled to Hawaii in 2008. And you will see uh, Bishop Matsumoto there. This was like in 2008. And we had about 200 participants that came through this 13 year program. Um, Many of our participants have become doctors now, engineers, teachers. Um, we have um, one BCA minister, Hawaii, I believe you have uh, Reverend Blaine mm -hmm. Nakas Nakasone. Nakasone. Mm -hmm. um, we have two mm -hmm. temple presidents here in BC that, are, that came through the program. Um, many of them are on the temple board. Uh, many are teaching Dharma school. And just recently, our uh, Miss Nisei week, yeah, the, the Miss Nisei in L LA in 2022 was a YEC participant. So, you know, we're, we're so proud of um, the, the many, or, or how they turned out to be, you know, that so many of them are really pursuing their dreams um, career-wise, but then they also do maintaining their yeah the the affiliation to the mm -hmm. temple and the the importance of giving back to the temple um so I, at this time um i'd like to um share a video okay. And let's see, I don't want to make it too loud and blast your ears. Oh, now, 
Okay, so maybe at this point we can ask if there are any questions or comments. Yeah, I just wanted to share that uh, one, I very recently saw Reverend Yukawa, and this is Yukawa, at Tacoma Buddhist Temple back in uh, October. Uh, they looked very well. They came to a seminar and, a, and the, the Dharma talk, and everyone was super happy to see them. Um, so they, they were looking really good. Um, also to mention that the Nembutsu seminar here on Maui used to be an overnighter. Yeah, oh. and people, we would start with people doing the, learning how to do the services and doing services, sleep overnight, discussions into the night, that sort of thing. But as the audience got older, apparently it shifted to a daytime thing. So. <laughs> uh, and also, I don't know, Reverend Bob, I think you were there, but at San Luis Obispo Temple, right? Mm -hmm. We were doing like summer retreats, about a week, mm -hmm. like mini Tokudo. I remember the late Russell Hamada was there. Mm -hmm. um, and just to tell you the story, I came away from that experience convinced that ministry was what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I come back home and I talk to my mother, uh, who should be online. Hi, mom. Um, <laughs> you know, and I said, Mom, yeah, I know what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be a minister. <laughs> and my mom turns to me and says, No, you don't. <laughs> uh, Honganji ministers, Honganji ministers don't make very much money and you, know, you, you probably want to make money and I can, um, so, so mom I can tell you you were right two ways uh, one I did want to go see the world and, and make money and do whatever um, but also you were absolutely right Honganji ministers don't get paid very much so that's a joke you can laugh at that point so. <laughs> uh, let's see if we have any questions coming in uh, one thing for the Zoom audience, if you'd like to have a question and then have a dialogue with Reverend Bob, uh, shoot it into the chat and then we'll, we, we can set it up so that you can, you know, we'll put you on camera, etc. Uh, does anybody here in the audience have a question? Okay. You need to go microphone. You're having trouble right now. Are these retreats open nationwide as well as Hawaii? Are these retreats open to the nation as well as Hawaii? Uh, you know, the retreats were um, um, open to, uh, well, we send out to all the BCA temples and I think to the Canada Hawaii. and Hawaii, Canada, Kyodan. And um, yeah, th they were open. And in fact, one year Hawaii sent uh, a delegate over to observe the entire week to see if they could have a retreat like this in Hawaii. And uh, at the end of the retreat, uh, she said, uh, this, this is great, but I don't think we could do this. <laughs> it, it takes too much work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, looking back, yeah, it, it, was a, it, was, it was a lot. But then it's always, for us, a labor of love, literally. Uh, something we looked forward to. And, um, and now I even look back more fondly on the 13 years we were able to run it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately, it came to a close. Um, we were told by the BCA administration that uh, the YAC retreat was not, uh, uh, what was it? Not, not it, it was not a part of the bishop's vision, uh, the new bishop's vision. And so also, I think there was some criticism that we weren't teaching Jodo Shinshu for some reason. But, you know, it's easy to criticize. If you're not doing anything, it's easy to say, ah, you're not doing this, ah, you should do that. But whatever, for whatever reasons, they, they, they dissolved the committee, the UYAC committee, and they ended the programs. Well, this is kind of interesting that uh, they told us we don't fit in with the bishop's vision, and then they wanted to start a youth retreat at the, the Jodo Shinshu Center. And so the bishop asked me, Said, uh, do you think you could, you and your your people can come to the Jodo Shinshu Center and train our folks how to run the retreat? <laughs> and I said, that's, that's silly. silly. I mean, I why? why you're, you're telling us that we don't fit into your vision, and yet you want us to come train your people? 
And uh, that was the end of that discussion. So. <laughs> okay, this is recorded now. Uh, I don't know. I'm really tired. <laughs> it's the truth. You don't right, run from the truth. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. You want to talk more, or you want to? Any, any, any? Are there any other questions or thoughts? Any other questions or comments uh, here in the audience or thoughts uh, from online? Let me go check my machine real quick. Uh, Alan, looks like he says, uh, "I need to be a little bit farther away." Um, you seem to get an echo when I use this. Uh, when I was at OBS, we held 10 day retreat for high school students, uh, IBS summer youth program. Mm -hmm. That's a comment mm -hmm. from Alan Uzaki. Yeah. Like one, two, and three, I believe. So, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't here in Hawaii during that time, so I don't know the history of the Yes Camp. Um, Maybe Alan or some of the other uh, uh, Hawaii-based people can talk about the beginning of the S camp, um, which I believe was modeled after what you guys were doing. Uh, and then, but that's yeah, it's just one of those things where I'm, I, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the, the, the origins of the S camp. But I think it's probably a very similar idea. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah, it wasn't a brand new concept by any means. But it, it was something that, you know, hasn't hadn't been done for a while. And we really felt that um, the, the conferences that were currently happening were just not fitting the, the needs of, of people. I mean, the WI conference was dwindling down to less than 100 people. And uh, I don't know, if, you know, like Alan, if if you attended any of the WI during your your time, but you know we're, they were in the hundreds, thousands, and well during your time, but um, yeah, it was really something very uh, popular, and we really look forward to it. And then again, you know when when we start seeing that something's not working or it's not meeting the needs, then the numbers start dropping, and we realize that. Yeah, some we need to make a change, or we need to do something different. And so we wanted to um, kick it up and and try to do something a little bit different. So yeah, we had to bring the B back to YBA, you know, because uh, I I think in the time of the Nisei when uh, YBA was really huge, I know in BCA they would have conferences that would draw thousands of, of young Buddhists and uh, it was they would take up multiple hotels and uh, when you think about that time pre and post war uh, this with the discrimination it was very difficult to really socialize in 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 the greater public and uh, nowadays uh, Kids are able to go anywhere and do anything. They could they, they could be entertained and to socialize. They they don't need to be within their Nikkei community or within their temple community. And so the socializing dimension of YBA that that fulfilled the need with a very important need that it filled in the 40s and the 50s, huh? And the, even the 60s, it began to diminish to where literally the the y, WYBL conference. Had had a hard time gathering less, and they would gather less than a hundred people nationwide. That's really sad. Yeah. So we knew that uh, it's not about just socializing. That's important, but we have to offer uh, a deeper Dharma experiential dimension. Uh, I think I need to ask a question on that point, uh, Reverend Bob and Reverend Patty. That uh, you know, it seems that particularly the, the, the retreat experience is really uh, experiential based. It's something you experience. So, so the idea of the nembutsu is a feeling, or that jodoshinshu is something that you can experience. Um, and yet, when we focus on ritual, when we focus on meditation, we focus on chanting, whatever you know, the quote-unquote practices are. Sometimes people will make the comment that's not jodoshinshu. 
Mm -hmm. uh, now, as a minister, of course, I'm supposed to answer that question, you know, but I'd like to flip it back to people. If it's not Jodo Shinshu, then we as ministers have done a terrible job defining what it is. Right? So that if, if Jodo Shinshu is not experience, it's not practice-based, it's a feeling, it can't be intellectualized, it cannot be explained, right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is it that we're supposed to be doing? <laughs> or flipping it around, what is it that period people who go to these retreats what is it that they're experiencing and how do we replicate that experience so other people can have that, a similar, uh, I guess, transformative experience? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the one that we've been post, we've been rocking our brains up trying to figure out what it is, uh, even for this youth retreat. Um, to this day, I mean, so many of them are so close. They still continue to meet and, and gather. Um, and so, you know, something something developed. Um, and so we're, we're, we're trying to figure that out too. But, well, <laughs> what? What? I don't know. Well, kind of in that context, uh, Gail Hamai, who's, who's actually watching remotely, sorry, my mistake. Uh, who's from Makwa Honganji says, on Maui, our junior YBA group has dwindled to just four members. Um, can you give us some ideas of how we can bring more interest mm -hmm. in expanding membership? Uh, I would also like to say that's about 90% of the junior YBA on the island of Maui. So uh, mm -hmm. YBA is not you know, the most uh, uh, popular activity for youth at this point in time. Yeah, and Gail, you're not alone. I think even here, uh, we're all su suffering that, you know, COVID really didn't do, um, do any good for us to, um, you know, being um, isolated, we didn't have the opportunity to, to meet and, and uh, do things together and develop friendships and relationships. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think our our junior YB is very um, is is struggling. Um, I know that they're trying to do a, set up a Yaba group here in SAC too, and and again that's struggling. It's just um, oh, I don't know what to say to to um, help you or to encourage you to to you just have to kind of just stay with them. Um, I think when, when I look back on the YAC retreat and how it grew and new programs came out of it, uh, the advanced training and the, the, the college age YB, all of these things uh, that happened, they, they weren't our ideas. You know, we on the retreat committee and on the YAC committee, we came up with nothing. You know, we were, were just open to hearing what did the kids want? What did they need? What, what is it they would like? And they would ask us, can we do this? And can we have this? And then we say, okay, you know, you, if that's what you'd like to try. Let's try to do it then. And uh, so growth, I think uh, my point is growth should be organic. You know, it should just happen. Uh, you can't make it happen. You can't force something to happen. You can't make something suddenly meaningful. You know, the meaning has to come uh, from the participants, okay. yeah, and uh, so maybe part of it is to listen to the kids. What is it that then? What are they going through? Uh, what is? What are their concerns or what are their interests? And uh, you know, and, and it's hard because junior YB they're just such a tough age too. They don't say anything. They're just too, they're cool and they just want to just sit in the back and. Um, so it, it's hard to get them to talk, but really, I think just just hanging, just hanging out with them and just <clears throat> chit chatting and, and you know even you know how was your week and maybe even um, you know just the the personal part of it, you know that you're curious and you're you're concerned about their personal life and their interests. That's that's kind of like a start with anything, with any kind of relationship, and right? I, I think just be open, mm -hmm. you know, to be open and available and approachable, to be uh, um, uh, their advisor that they want to come to, 
you know, you're you're not a supervisor. You're you're there. You're just an older person with a little more experience. That you know, if they're if they want to talk to you, that if they feel comfortable, they'll come forward. Mm -hmm. And sure, yeah, maybe this example. It was 1990 June. I remember we were here six years, and we had just bought our first home, and we're sitting in the backyard one warm Sacramento June evening and it was around close to midnight and doorbell rings and one of our YBA kids came in high school seniors and uh, then a little later another one came over and uh, and the two guys are there and they're, and uh, and in a small talk they come to visit you know minister and his wife in their home at midnight and I thought oh okay well and then we're sit all well, sat in the backyard, just enjoying the evening, having a cool something to drink. And then uh, finally, I asked, "So, what are you guys here for? <laughs> what brought you here?" And then they said, "Well, you know, a bunch of us were talking earlier tonight about where we're going to go to school and our goals and going to college and what we want to do with our lives." And and then we started talking about what our goal in life is and we realized that none of us knew what our goal in life is. And then we, and we thought, well, let's go see Reverend Bob and Patty and ask them, what, are your, what is your goal in life? So they actually just you know, felt comfortable enough to come over at midnight and, and then they said, so what is your goal in life? And I remember I was uh, so happy to receive this question because I told them, I, I thought about this one. <clears throat> and uh, and I shared with them that you know my goal in life is not to accumulate any great wealth or to become famous. You know, uh, my goal in life is very simple. It's that my goal is to be able to, when my time comes, to be able to let go of life with no regret. You know, if I could do that, that would be amazing. And that was it. You know, and. Uh, it was just looking back, it was just very interesting that they felt comfortable enough to come over and ask. Mm -hmm. And which I think um, is our example that just as advisors and leaders, uh, be open and approachable and try to be that, be people that they, the, the mm -hmm. kids will want to talk to and if they have a question. And uh, from there, I would imagine, you know, only positive things can happen. Okay, we have a question here in the audience from I my parents. Hi, um, Reverend Bob, I agree with you about trying to attract the younger ones and then with the younger ones, the parents will come and as they find, um, have a foundation of Buddhism and what it means to them, um, I truly believe that they would continue on the path of the YBA and, you know, membership can grow in that sense. I also liked very much what you had said, that um, the services you have every month, the first Sunday was dedicated to the adults. And then the other Sundays would be dedicated to the Dharma school, which is so essential, as you had mentioned it. So my thought is, what does it look like when you have Sunday services focusing on the, um, the youth, the younger people? What did it look like? Uh, what does it look like? Yeah, we had families coming, everyone sitting together. You're not having a separate children's service. You're having one service with everyone, grandparents, parents, children, and uh, have a message that you know, I would say max 10 or 12 minutes, you know, maybe a little longer, maybe a little uh, shorter, but uh, never longer than that. And when uh, Patty and her, her group, when they finished Tokudo, they really started to ask me things like, you know, how do you prepare a Dharma message? And I, I said, I don't know, I just do it and had to think about it. And uh, when I thought about it, I, I gave them this analogy that I really feel uh, I, I like it today, uh, that in preparing a Dharma message, we're not trying to 
prepare a great lecture or a banquet, I, I compare the Dharma messages that uh, I gave as I called them Dharma or d'oeuvres, <laughs> you know, you create something delicious and small and it's an appetizer and people who come, they're going to eat it and taste it and they go, oh, that's good, you know, and then they might ask, is there any more? <laughs> and they say, no, that's it for this week, but if you come next week, there'll be more. <laughs> and, and and then hopefully even more that their curiosity is in uh, how do I make this myself? Uh, and then not just that, if this is the hors d'oeuvres, what's the ban what's the dinner like? What's the banquet like? And how do I begin to cook Dharma dinners for myself and for my family? And so the keeping keeping the messages you know on point. And I sent Re Reverend Kerry um what I talked to Patty's group when they came back from Tokudo and have used since in many different ways. But, you know, keeping it short, keeping it sensible, I think is the most important thing, keeping it relevant and that it applies to us, you know, to me. Uh, and then, you know, good things happen. You know, good things are looking back, good things did happen. Yeah, because I think when you're excited, to share something in your Dharma talk, it shows and people can feel mm -hmm. it. So I think that's real important too, that mm -hmm. people feel that. So this is how inexperienced I am. Okay, so after you have your Dharma talk, then do you um, have the kids meet after the Sunday service or is that the Sunday service? No, after no. the Dharma message, then the kids will all break up into classrooms. Mm -hmm. okay. They would have you know, by from preschool, we have a preschool class, a kindergarten class, first grade, second grade, all the way to high school. And um, uh, then <laughs> there were, when, when we hit our peak of like 420 kids, we had so many kids that that we had to have three third grade classes, huh? Mm -hmm. I think there were like must have been 60 kids that just in that were nine years old. <laughs> Yeah, it was amazing, but you know, it was um, again. It just happened, and uh, I, I remember, you know, we never thought of growing the temple. We were just trying to make sure that every you know child understands something about Buddhism that they feel resonates with them, that they would be be happy to share. And when one day, I think after about four years, mm -hmm. one hundred maybe about four years into being there. One day after Sunday service, Dharma school, Pat, Patty said to me, have you noticed that the hondo is getting kind of full? And I said, you know, and I, I never did. And uh, so I started to notice that the next week I looked and yeah, I guess it is getting full. And what happened was it's like, uh, you know, a parent watching their children grow, you don't see the growth because it's so gradual. And Looking back on the rosters, I I saw that uh, the, our growth annually was maybe between 10 to 15% in, in the Dharma school attendance. And, you know, when you have 75 kids and you get 10%, that's maybe 78 kids, you don't really notice that. But when you get up to 250 kids, you know, and 10%, and the next year you have 25, 30 kids more, uh, it, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to feel like, wow, it's just getting pretty full. Well, hopefully, so, um, within the next um, 25 years, our um, our goal will be to build classrooms here at Makawao. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. I appreciate your comments. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'd like to read a comment from Ken Okimoto, who was involved in the original Yes Camps. I remember Ken. He's yeah. from uh, Pop he's from Papai Ko. <laughs> there <you> go. <laughs> so, so, I think our temples and its programs need to be more relevant to today's world. We no longer need to be plantation Japanese social clubs. Now we have to be what we are supposed to be, Buddhist temples. So what is that? Um, I think the criteria is to ask ourselves uh, what is 
today's society's suffering uh, or dis-ease, uh, what is deeply troubling us? Yes, Camp told me that today's suffering is loneliness, loneliness in all caps. Uh, the secret to Yes Camp's success was friendship, sincere, close friendships. Our temples need to develop uh, closer, meaningful friendships. It's okay to be a fun place. Uh, indicator of success, they cry as they left the camp. Uh, so that's a comment from Ken. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, do we have any other questions here in the audience? Do we have one in the back here? Hi, Urban and Um You chose a really interesting time to go to Sacramento, 1985. Uh, the community was really changing. Were those temples that you sent people to to um, get a taste of before coming back to your place, were they new temples or were they pre-existing ones? Well, Sacramento Betsin is the second oldest temple on the mainland, founded in 1899. So we, we have roots and history here. But the temples, uh, like Florin is a sister temple, Jomo Shinchi temple, uh, that's been around for quite a while. And uh, what Sacramento temple was relatively new. Uh, maybe yeah, Bonte was new. Bonte's temple was new, uh, maybe about 20, 30 years old. And then the meditation. And the meditation group, group started in probably 1984, because I remember going there when I first came, and they were just forming. And I still meet with this group. Uh, I just met with them uh, recently, I think last weekend, virtually. And uh, uh, I, I, it, it's so nice to see them grow to from a handful of people to now where they purchased the property and they have their own temple. And uh, my encouragement when I met this group, because it was, they were all non-Nikkei, right? And it's a very interesting group of se genuine seekers. And I told them in 1984, and I told them again last week when I met them, again, I said that my encouragement for you remains this, remain independent, don't join any particular sect. Don't, not, not mine, not, not anyone. anyone. And become the Dharma buffet for, you know, for America. That just invite as many different teachers as you'd like and, and put the flavors of the Dharma on the Dharma buffet. And it's group like, groups like you that will eventually define what is, what is American Buddhism. You know, it won't be me. It won't be anybody else, it won't be any individual, but it's the people themselves, you know, when they decide what flavors of the Dharma resonate with them, uh, then this will become what is American Buddhism. <clears throat> so I think uh, everyone who, who's seeking, they're looking for something different. Mm -hmm. And so we would send them other places. And when they came back, it's I think it's because I, I, I like to think it's because they knew that uh, come, in coming to the Sacramento bed scene, they were coming to a place that was concerned with their, their search. Uh, not that you add to our membership or that you add to our, our uh, membership growth or, and, and, and join and pay money, but, you know, that essentially what, let us help us with your search if we can. Okay, thank you. Um, that's probably better than somebody who's just there because they can't find any other place. So, <laughs> yeah, Reverend Bob and Reverend Fatty, I can share that I do. Uh, I do the same thing here in Maui. You know, really? you walk in and go, oh, "What kind of Buddhists are you?" Uh, and when they get that question, obviously they have you know, studied some some Buddhism. Mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, you know, going from one spectrum to the other, we get the reaction, oh, you're Christian Buddhists. <laughs> Which I like, All right, you're gonna come into my temple and you're gonna do that, all right. But, um, <laughs> calm down, look at you, calm down. Um, but I, I, I will very, if they're looking for more practice space, I refer them to, to the, the Lama at the Maui Dharma Center, Tibetan Buddhists. Uh, if they want to do meditation, hey, go down and go see the, the, the mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the Sotoshu, you know, Temple Mount of Fuji. Uh, mm -hmm. If you'd like to, to go to Jodo, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Jodo is a great guy. He's very interesting. But if you go practice days, when when you reach the limit of your practice, you know, and you can't go on any further, come back and share that with me. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you become Buddha while meditating, please, please, please come back. <laughs> we all get speakers on Sundays, you know. So. That's good. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of times people just, yeah, they kind of expect me, I think, to be this kind of, you know, oh, Buddhism is this. Um, I don't know if they get that from, like, Mr. Miyagi or what, but, you know, <laughs> other version. But that's, you know, because the minister is the first point of contact in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, that it's just one of those things when people walk in, you, you never know exactly where they're coming from or what they're seeking. Um, so it'd be a mistake. I agree it'd be a mistake to just say, oh, just say not long enough. Right. Uh, or, give I, the, or give them a membership <laughs> form. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that usually comes later. So. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got four minutes left before a scheduled break. Any questions here in house or coming in from Zoom land? This is your chance, everybody. You got, you know, last, last, last couple minutes. Especially Patty, she's going to try to run away later, so <laughs> ask her any questions. <laughs> okay. Well, if we don't have any questions from the Zoom audience or from the in-house audience, uh, Reverend Bob or Reverend Patty, if you have a closing comment you'd like to make, otherwise we'll just say we'll stop here and then go to lunch. You know, I have a couple of... Um, I, I printed up some reflections for moments like this that we used at the California State Assembly. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, here's one. This is one of my favorites. This is one that uh, was on, we, we would open the California Assembly floor session. So mm -hmm. uh, if you can imagine all the assembly, the legislatures are there. And then before the, it opens, they call us to the front. And to open in rather than a prayer, we open with a reflection. And here's a, here's one that Patty used on February 14th, Valentine's Day in 2020, the last year of our, our service. This is yours. Oh. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Please join me in Gosho. When I was first dating Bob in Los Angeles about 40 years ago. I worked for an aerospace company called TRW. On one of our early dates, he picked me up right after work. We went to a theater in the Crenshaw area that was showing Zatoichi, the blind swordsman. Fans of Zatoichi know that it, in each of his many movies, he would eat like his meals were few and far between. It might be a bowl of rice. Often it was a huge rice ball, what we call onigiri. He ate with such enthusiasm. Rice would collect all over his face. It always looked so delicious. I recall we went to the early showing because it was right after work. I was getting really hungry, but it was early in our dating and I was looking forward to the movie. I remember well that in the first eating scene, Zatoichi was gobbling down this huge onigiri rice ball. It was then that Bob leaned over and said to me, boy, that sure looks good. I agreed. Then he said, do you want an onigiri? I said, oh yeah. Then he reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out two onigiri and handed <laughs> one to me. It was even more delicious watching Zato Ichi eating his onigiri as we devoured ours. That was a memorable date because that evening, I said those three little words to Bob for the very first time. When he handed me the onigiri, I looked at him and said, you're so weird. <laughs> I think that that may have been one of the first moments I thought would be interesting to be with this strange man. And four decades later, I am still grateful for the laughter we continue to share, for laughter is essential to love.
Namo Amidavatsu. Namo Amidavatsu. Namo Amidavatsu. With kindness and gratitude beyond words. That's the first, <clears throat> that's the first we were told later <laughs> when she finished this, the, the assembly <laughs> broke into applause. And then someone told us that's the first time that uh, a prayer or reflection received applause at the end. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, my, my only comment is, Reverend Bob, oh, you're so weird. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so we'll stop for lunch here. Uh, we are scheduled to come back uh, after lunch at 1 o'clock, and this will be session number three, uh, Jodo Shinshu for Temple Leaders and Temple Leadership. Uh, so Zoom audience, please uh, remember to come back. <laughs> Um, and so we'll break for lunch and we'll be back online at one o'clock. So thank you everybody, Reverend Bob, everybody, thank you so much for this morning and we'll see you in a little bit. <laughs>